Welcome to Critical Thinking Live, Friends of Europe's online offering where we bring you leaders of from the private sector, public sector, civil society across the world. Those who make decisions, have opinions, have views, who shape our lives every day. And this is our regular offering where we bring you a leader of that kind. Today, I'm very pleased to be able to um, welcome Joseph Ansbacher, the new Director General of the European Space Agency. It's particularly important for us because today we're also going to launch our our new initiative in partnership with the European Space Agency, and that's Making Space Matter. It's a new program where we're working together to really think through uh, and make space matter. It's what it, what it says on the tin is what we want to do with this program, which is how do we make sure space is something which is a, a force for good, a social good, um, whilst we think about the other particular implications and consequences of what space might do. What all of us know, uh, those who are, you know, have been watching the news, uh, looking up the stars, what we do know is the space race is on. Just in the space of the last eight or nine months, we have seen every major superpower launch a missile and exploration into space. There is definitely a sense of urgency uh, appearing on, on the frontier around who will take most of space up, but also who will create the greatest opportunity, both in terms of what it does for security, what it does for climate change, what it does for the kind of commercialization and trade and investment. So these are big topics that we'll cover today. But firstly, let me a warm welcome to Joseph. Joseph, thank you very much for joining us. And also congratulations on, on becoming the, the new Director General of the European Space Agency. A warm welcome to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And it's a real pleasure being with uh, Friends of Europe. It's uh, always a fantastic round and I really look forward to this. Joseph, I'd like to hear from you in, in terms of what do you think are the conditions that the EU needs to meet to become a real superpower in space, uh, both for its citizens, but also for security, politics more widely. As this month, we celebrate the first man in space. What are the developments and progress that we've made in these past 60 years that point to what the next 60 years might hold for us? Joseph, over to you. Oh, thank you. And... Uh... What does it need for Europe to be a superpower in space? Uh, I would say Europe has all the ingredients to be a superpower in space. Uh, we may not have all the headlines uh, that uh, America and uh, China is producing uh, recently, uh, which is quite remarkable. And I have a bit of jealousy and a bit of envy when I, when I look at these screens and I see yet another Mars rover landing. And it ha doesn't happen to be ours, but uh, ours uh, will be coming uh, uh, next year. Um, or next year, there will be the launch of it. Uh, the landing will be uh, afterwards. But uh, now, what does it really mean? And this is a very good reflection I, I, I want to raise uh, to a higher political level in Europe. Of course, we are the European Space Agency. We are not a political body. Uh, therefore, our job is to really develop spacecraft and rockets and uh, uh, send astronauts into space and make sure space technology is developed in Europe. But I would like to help uh, the political um, uh, players in Europe to develop the arguments of what does it really need to be a space power. In my opinion, and this is exactly as, as you say, uh, Europe is, uh, has room for improvement and there is uh, certainly a need to reflect uh, where, uh, what is the ambition for the next decade. Let's just uh, take uh, the US uh, for a moment. Uh, the US uh, has created a space force at the end of 2019. Uh, the NASA budget has just been increased. Also, the Department of Defense is spending uh, huge amounts of money in, uh, in space. Plus, of course, in the US, you have uh, the commercial sector. Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, uh, investing immensely in space. Uh, also, Silicon Valley creating a lot of companies uh, in the space domain, uh, funded by venture capital first and foremost. And then you have the other side of the globe, where you have China, uh, also massively investing in space, but for a, a different reason. Uh, in China, mostly uh, to help the nation to become a global superpower. And uh, President Xi Jinping has really declared space as one element to become a superpower. And that comes back to your question, what does Europe need to be a, a superpower in space? Uh, let me say that Europe is a superpower economically and politically, uh, at a similar level as uh, uh, the US or China, a bit different, but a similar level. But in space, we are not at the same level in terms of funding. Uh, the funding of NASA is about, or the, uh, the public funding in the US, I should say, is about five, six, seven times larger than in Europe. Uh, still, uh, despite the much lower funding in Europe, Europe has developed some 
uh, elements in space where we are world leaders. Take Copernicus, take Galileo, uh, where Europe has uh, the best technology and we have the gold standard which we have developed. So we can do it, but we need a bit more effort and push in order to really become a major player comparable with the US, with Russia, with China, uh, as it uh, is happening right now. Joseph, that's really helpful. And we'll come back to that in conclusion, I think, because I think there are a number of questions here about the relationship between what happens in space and what is currently happening in space and are the security of our future in the next, uh, let's say, next, even next five years, let alone next 10 years. Um, but let me turn to connectivity, which is related to security. We know there are big ambitions in terms of making sure that we have speed, higher quality connectivity. There are ambitions of a you know, secure space-based connectivity and 5G, but also beyond 5G. What's the ESA going to do about that? Yeah. Well, first, let's just recall that uh, on broadband internet, uh, Europe is not present at the moment. Uh, there is Starlink being built up by Elon Musk. There is Kuiper in the making, uh, again, by Jeff Bezos in, in the US. There are some other initiative. So there's one web which is uh, about uh, being built up with uh, some bubbles, as we, as we know, uh, along the way. But uh, Europe uh, certainly needs uh, uh, a massive uh, investment and also to be part of this uh, secure connectivity or broadband internet, uh, which uh, uh, is currently uh, under discussion. And I have to say that uh, Commissioner Breton was uh, quite courageous and quite visionary uh, to put such a proposal on the table. Uh, of course, uh, uh, now it has to be materialized. Uh, we have to see which building blocks are coming together to make it happen. Uh, certainly, ESA can uh, uh, contribute significantly to it because we have uh, uh, quite a lot of ex uh, expertise, uh, engineering, uh, but also program management expertise, which we can offer to establish such a large scale uh, uh, space program uh, for Europe. Uh, but also we have experience in uh, accumulated over the, uh, over the last years through these projects. We have got, for example, subscriptions at the last ministerial, uh, which we can still allocate towards supporting secure connectivity. And these are several hundreds of millions of euros, which uh, we have uh, received from our member states. Of course, we need to discuss with them on how to orient those uh, funding uh, contributions, but certainly secure connectivity and the initiative of uh, Commissioner Breton is, uh, I would say, almost a golden opportunity to really work together Joseph, and Joseph create a European flagship. You. Indeed, Josie, let me interrupt you for a second. What I hear from you, and this is my interpretation, is that we're actually not in the game. It seems like Bezos and Musk, like Google has done before and uh, Facebook, etc., those private sector merchants of the future uh, in terms of tech have basically claimed ground and the governments have caught up pace. And now we find ourselves where we actually we know we've made mistakes about privacy, monopolization, competition, etc. Um, what needs to happen? This is it sounds like this is a political question for Europe. I'm not putting you on the spot here, but it sounds like we're, we're nowhere near the game of connectivity. And if Europe wants to be a superpower in space, surely it needs to get this right. It surely needs to get this right, clear. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the private sector. That's also what needs to happen in Europe. I mean, we have uh, fantastic uh, private operators uh, in Europe are uh, quite uh, uh, large uh, in terms of their turnovers and their reach to the customers. And yes, I mean, they are the best partners with whom this has to be built up. So this is not something that uh, is only a matter of the private sector, of the public sector. Of course, we, as ESA, we can stimulate, we can develop technology, we can put concepts together. In the case of secure connectivity, obviously, we are, have our own interest to make sure that institutions are being connected securely uh, and they can communicate using uh, the latest technology. We are thinking here of uh, quantum uh, key distribution, quantum technology, uh, mm -hmm. which certainly is uh, a next big step forward, uh, which uh, where Europe is, has always been good in uh, leapfrogging uh, technologies and innovation through completely new systems. And this is something we are working on. Uh, and we will need to uh, put a system in place that is not a copy of something that exists somewhere else, but is our own solution for our own needs, but also with our own ingenuity and, uh, uh, and excellence, uh, which we build into these systems. But it's, what occurs to me, these are my words, that Mr. Breton needs to actually move much faster um, and actually get, you know, get, get on the game, because otherwise we're going to miss out, clearly in Europe. And it would be a pity, wouldn't it? Because what you have in the ESA is a, a global standard, world-leading capacity in satellite observation and a whole range of other technologies. And it seems like 
there is this opportunity that we might miss. Is well, How confident are you that we won't miss that opportunity? Which is, I know, a political question for you, Joseph. I'm not asking you to be a politician, but what's your sense? No, we will not miss the opportunity because um, it, is, it is a must that we, we need to succeed in this. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Speed is an issue. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, I, I honestly say uh, also in ESA and in Europe, we, we have not been the fastest in implementing and making decisions and then implementing pro uh, programs. And this is actually at the core of also my, I call it Agenda 2025. This is the, the vision which I put on the table, uh, elaborated with our member states and with my staff uh, uh, in ESA, uh, also of course discussed with the European Commission. What does Europe need in order to move ahead and to be more dynamic, more uh, responsive, but also much faster in order to deal with these new commercial players that are on the market that are coming. And we can not just be standing by and watching what's happening. We have to be driving this uh, game. Of course, the commercial sector has to do its part, uh, I hope uh, most of it, but uh, they will need us as we know perfectly well, uh, SpaceX would not exist without NASA. Uh, and in Europe also, it does need ESA to stimulate and create these uh, commercial players. But yes, we have to do a lot in order to come to a level where Europe uh, retains or maintains uh, or develops uh, leadership in, in several sectors. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that, because what occurs to me is that in, in the context of a pandemic and an economic crisis, it sounds like we have everything available in terms of the resources, capacity, intelligence, innovation, uh, to be able to leapfrog. But this is not just about competition. This is about securing our future on the planet and other planets. And actually we have a game-changing opportunity, but let's hope Mr. Breton and others uh, are listening and actually not negotiate our future on the precarity of what's happening in the next 12 or 18 months, but actually have long-term vision. Let's talk about member states for a moment, shall we? Because you are a creature of the member states, if you like. And so therefore you do need to have member states support you, uh, buy the ambition, but also see the sense of urgency. Tell us, what's the role that you're playing um, at ESA to ensure the involvement of member states? And I can imagine the politics that we see in the EU spills out also within the council in terms of east, yeah. west, north, south. Is that a reality for you? And what are you doing about that? Yeah. No, no, our member states are our uh, guide and guiding stakeholders. As you say, we are a creature of our member states, and that's absolutely true. They have a huge influence on on what we do and how we do it and, uh, and, and what should be the outcome of it. Uh, they are funding all our programs. And if they don't like our proposals, they don't put money into, our, into ESA and there will be no space program. So also on our side, we are uh, very concerned that our programs are very interesting to them and uh, are um, certainly, uh, I would say, to their liking so that they can really put their own money uh, into the pot. Uh, so this is... Uh, and certainly the most important aspect, because uh, uh, the member states are the ones that uh, define the political agenda. And that's why I would like to organize with our member states uh, a dialogue uh, to really discuss where should Europe go in the next uh, decade. And this is not for the next two or three years, but really next 10, 15, 20 years. What does Europe want to achieve? And I think what uh, uh, should be happening is, and uh, for this I'm proposing together with the Commission to organize a space summit, uh, uh, in uh, next uh, in spring next year, where politicians come together and define Europe in the context of the global space landscape, uh, the US, uh, China, and others, and say, what does Europe want? What do we want Europe to do? Do we want Europe to go to the moon? Do we want Europe to go to Mars? Do we want Europe to send robots on uh, on another planet or, or another moon? Uh, and what should they do? What is also the use of space in daily life? Uh, we have heard uh, climate uh, and sustainability as driving forces. Yes, Europe is leading today in this domain. Do we want to lead in the next decade? Uh, do we want to use these uh, assets for uh, our society to, to keep them safe, but also to create added value in the economy? Because there's huge opportunities coming up here. So a lot to debate, and this debate I really uh, need to prepare, we need to prepare it well, because it is so essential for the population of Europe. Joseph, that's good to hear. So you're going to bring, you're going to create a space summit for Europe. Is that right? Is that what I'm hearing? And you're going to have the first, that first of those opportunities. Good to hear it today at the announcement of our joint initiative on making space matter as our joint program. But you're going to have a space summit next spring where you're going to be able to bring together people to have a, or rather create a shared future and vision for space. That's correct. And that's uh, a big ambition, um, and it needs uh, really the cooperation of the ones involved, but I will be working very hard uh, to, to get this achieved. 
Well, I look forward to talking to you about that sooner, uh, obviously later in the year before the summit happens. But can we talk, can we move to a matter of commercialization? I referred to obviously earlier that we know that our web our, 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 and our, you know, um, I, you know our infrastructure for the World Wide Web and elsewhere has in effect been monopolized by private sector entrepreneur or, or, or enterprise. Um, what's the threat or opportunity around commercialization of space? Are we going to see, you know, um, Amazon Space Inc. Uh, or, you know, uh, Facebook Space Inc. take over our, 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 you know, our communications? Give us your sense of what are the threats and opportunities for commercialization of space? Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, commercialization in space or off space is a reality today already. You mentioned uh, uh, Amazon, uh, you mentioned uh, SpaceX, uh, they are commercializing uh, in a drastic way of how we do business today in space. And this is a, a trend that uh, is not completely new. Uh, it started some 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it always existed, but it uh, really started with this intensity some 10, 15 years ago. But today it's very real and it's very strong. Uh, the investments in the US and the commercial sector have been uh, last year about 5 billion uh, US dollars. In Europe, it has been 188 million. So you see the dimensions here uh, the of, of the different uh, continents. So this is, uh, there's a lot to be done. Uh, there's a huge economic opportunity. Uh, that's why private companies invest. Uh, Elon Musk is not doing it for the sake of mankind. He wants to make money and- uh, Indeed. Uh, and eventually go to Mars, I guess, with the money he makes on uh, selling services on, on the earth. Uh, some economists, uh, Morgan Stanley, for example, has estimated that the, the global space economy uh, will go to one trillion US dollar by the year 2040. Today, it's uh, about one third of that. Uh, so there are huge opportunities. And I certainly want Europe as a continent uh, with its startups, with its uh, uh, companies, uh, big and small, to participate in this uh, uh, space economy, in this growth, uh, not only participate, to even drive it uh, and be a major player uh, and a leader in some aspects of, of this really growing uh, segment of our society. Joseph, I want to turn very briefly to something that might be seem, seeming seemingly geeky, but one of the things that we've learned about the pace of technological change is the governments have played catch up in terms of regulation. Look at what's happening with regard to you know, privacy, data, etc. Do you have a sense, because I've not heard this from Thierry Bertrand, is about the, the regulation of space, what the role Europe has? Because when we think about the opportunity you, just, you describe, you can imagine that it's going to be a scramble for space. And we'll find out, we'll find out later, actually, money is important, but then public safety and public good will then follow as a poor second. Uh, that's exactly what's happening right now in space. Uh, so I, I would probably call it that uh, at the moment we have the Wild West happening out, out in space and cowboys are uh, populating uh, the outer space. What happened in, in the US uh, 500 years ago is now happening in space. New uh, territories are being conquered and uh, in space also new orbits are being conquered and the uh, satellites are placed there. Uh, and some constellations of these uh, broadband internet uh, uh, companies are placing uh, thousands of satellites in space. Uh, there are plans uh, to have more than 10,000 uh, satellites for the broadband internet con constellation coming up now. And that's wow. huge. Uh, and uh, of course, it's these 10,000 satellites, which by itself is an issue, especially for astronomers, because they are, uh, they are uh, being an obstacle in their observation of, of the stars. But leaving this alone, it also creates uh, a completely new question of regulation, as you say. What do we do? Who is regulating traffic in space? Is there a space traffic management system or as we have an air traffic management system and, mm. uh, in, in airspace? Uh, and these questions are, today are not really governed. Uh, there are, of course, some observing uh, systems, some uh, countries that have a, a strong, the US in particular, a very strong um, uh, network to observe what's happening. But in terms of regulation, really there's not much happening. Uh, and this is something that needs to come. Uh, there will be an effort made, in my opinion, uh, but it will probably need uh, or it will only be the consequence of uh, two or three very bad collisions of spacecraft Indeed. Uh, when the people wake up and say there's a big crisis and now we need to do something about it. And then it will uh, most likely happen. I, I do not wish that uh, this disaster is needed to, to create this dialogue, but yes, this dialogue is absolutely needed. Thank you for that, Joseph, because I think I hope that anyone that's uh, watching out there, uh, please keep an eye on this one because we will also continue because it's part of our Making Space Matter program. We are going to focus on the governance of space. We're going to work with the ESA and others because actually, if there's one thing we've learned for the past 25, 30 years is that we need to be more preventative and proactive when we see 
the tectonic sh uh, plates under the under the earth shift and actually space is one of those and we can see the opportunities developments but also the huge threats to our uh, humanity and security in the decades to come and it feels like there's an opportunity to act now rather than to leave it to later oh, my, my final points to you joseph are about that issue of humanity and common good citizens um what is from your perspective, and I've read some of the stuff you've written and some of the ambitions you have for the European Space Agency. You know, you want to make space cool for young people. And I think that's, I think it's an important thing because actually that sense of exploration for young minds is key. Um, what's, what, what would you say to, what, what's the, how does space, why should space matter to, to citizens of Europe, to people in Europe? Yeah. I mean, space uh, certainly has to matter. But first of all, you couldn't live without space. Or if you would switch off all the satellites and all the, the space infrastructure, uh, your phone wouldn't work, uh, your car navigation system wouldn't, wouldn't work, uh, uh, the weather forecast uh, would be very bad, and uh, you would uh, uh, certainly get very wet uh, when you wouldn't expect it. So in, in many aspects of daily life, also to do with uh, security and so on, you do need space because it's an essential element of the infrastructure. So you are relying on it, uh, and this is necessary. But also, as you say, to protect our planet, our climate change, our sustainability, uh, avoiding or being better prepared for the next pandemic. Uh, first, of course, getting out of this one, but being pre better prepared for these things to happen. You need assets from space because uh, uh, they, are taking, they are taking the pulse of our planet with our satellites and there you know exactly what happens. But what I really want uh, to achieve, and this is apart from helping uh, our citizens with the space infrastructure and the assets is to also create a new spirit, a new vision, a new inspiration, new energy, uh, which we need to get out of this crisis uh, uh, after COVID. And I would like to attract the young people, uh, females in particular, but also males, obviously, but females uh, in particular, because I would like to have a balanced, young, talented workforce, uh, diverse uh, from different backgrounds, uh, politically, uh, uh, eth ethically uh, uh, from different religions and different countries and so on, to really have a, a melting pot of energy uh, within the space community that helps us uh, uh, bringing new ideas and creating new visionary projects. And that's what we need. We, new, we need new energy, we need a new momentum. And this is what I would like to create with ESA. Of course, it takes time, I know, uh, but uh, this is uh, certainly uh, an ambition which I have uh, for ESA as an agency, as an entity, uh, which should inspire these young people. That's a really a powerful statement to conclude on because um, it is key in terms of what we've seen uh, in terms of how a young woman uh, unsettled the world and created a, a movement around climate change. We need to make sure that those kind of voices, those people who are brave and to create that kind of community building is also uh, evident in space. And I hope that, you know, whether it's called Erasmus space uh, or whatever, but it's, there's an opportunity here, isn't there? And I think what we people watching and listening is that here's an opportunity for you to engage. You've heard from the Director, Director General of the European Space Agency, get involved and see if, you, if you're interested, please be in touch and in terms of how you can be involved and keep an eye on the European Space Agency website, obviously, for opportunities and, and the other, other uh, opportunities that he that J Joseph has been speaking about in this half hour conversation that we've had. Joseph, thank you very much. This has been a, a great opportunity to to chat with you in these early days of your your new tenure as a director general of the European Space Agency. We look forward to working with you on Making Space Matter, our new program. And keep an eye on our website to our viewers. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Dharmendra Kanani. I'm Chief Spokesperson at Friends of Europe. And keep an eye on our website for our next online offering. And all I have to say is keep safe, mind your distance, and thank you very much. And thank you, Joseph, for being with us. Well, thank you also from my side. It was a real pleasure. and. Uh... Uh, let me just say a last word that we have a, a call for astronauts open to apply females and males. We look young talents, uh, www.isa.int, uh, and I would look forward to get thousands of applications. We need young, talented, inspired people. Thank you. You heard it here first, colleagues. Make sure you note that down and apply. It would be great to see the diversity of Europe getting involved in space matters, but especially in making space matter more. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again online in the next debate that we have. Keep an eye on our website, Friends of Europe. Thank you very much. Take care.